morning. I'm happy to see all of you here this morning, and I'm happy uh, to have those of you who are watching online with us as well. My name is Shirley Halgan, and we have been studying the book of Genesis. Um, and I wanted to kind of give just an overview of where we are in the book of Genesis. It's a pretty long book in the Bible. Um, so, of course, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are focused on creation and then the fall of man. And so we had the stories about Adam and Eve. We had Noah and the great flood. Uh, we had the Tower of, ba of Babel. And then in chapter 12, we begin to see the story of God's plan of redemption. It starts to kind of unfold for us in chapter 12. And we know that redemption for the world will come through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, of course, we've been learning about Abraham and Isaac and then Jacob and now his 12 sons that we're, we're uh, talking about as well. Um, and of course, we know that Jacob and his 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. So when we talk about the stories about those 12 boys, we are learning about the very earliest of Israel's history. Because um, God changed Jacob's name to Israel and it's his 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of Israel. So today's Bible story is going to focus on um, Jacob's favorite son, Joseph. And we know that Joseph was born to Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And uh, the whole entire rest of the book of Genesis is going to be about Joseph and his life and all the things that happened to Joseph. Um, and you know that after, after studying um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these stories that we get into about J Jacob's children there's a lot of trouble. Jacob's children get into a lot of trouble, a lot of sin going on. Um, and today we're going to just talk about more of that, more sin, more trouble from Jacob's kids. Last week, we know that Jacob's children got into trouble after Jacob and his household set up camp outside of Shechem. His daughter Dinah went into the city to find some female friends and unfortunately, while she was there, she was raped by the prince of Shechem. And then her brothers, Simeon and Levi, they go into Shechem to seek revenge. After they tricked all the men of Shechem into being circumcised, they went in while the men were down, still recovering, and they slaughtered all the men in the city of Shechem. And then the rest of the brothers came along and... and they saw all the dead bodies and they looted the city. And then they took all the women and children against their will. So it was just horror upon horror in last week's Bible story. Um, and this week we're going to see more sin from these sons of, of Jacob. Um, and, you know, after our story last week, we don't really focus on what happened in chapter 35, but at the end of chapter 35, we sadly read about the passing of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel, and his father, Jacob. Um, Rachel, who was pregnant with her second son, died in childbirth. Jewish tradition holds that she was only 36 years old or so when she passed away. There's some disagreement about her exact age, but I think the consensus is that she was a young woman around the age of 36 or so when she when she died. Genesis 35, 16 through 18, it says, Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Eph Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Onai, but his father named him Benjamin. So it's kind of a sad story about Rachel. She, she was loved by Jacob, but she had trouble having children. She did finally have Joseph, and now, as she's giving birth to her second son, she passes away. So she doesn't get to live to see him grow up. Um, and then in Genesis 35, 27 through 29, we hear about the passing of Isaac. It says there, Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre, near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. 
So I'm glad that Esau and Jacob kind of reconciled so that when Isaac passed away, they, they did bury him together. Um, and today, as we get into our story about Joseph, um, this story running through it, there's an undercurrent of jealousy between the brothers. And we know um, that really started with their mothers, right? <laughs> so when Jacob ended up getting tricked into marrying Leah, there was just this built-in rivalry between these two women. And that, unfortunately, that jealousy and that rivalry got passed down to their children. Um, and if you look at the definition of jealousy, there's really two definitions I want to read to you today. The first one says uh, jealousy is vigilant and protective of one's rights or possessions. And this form of jealousy isn't necessarily bad. Um, it's even used to describe God. Exodus 34, 14 says, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And God is jealous for our affection. Um, and then Jesus in Matthew 22 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So God wants us to love him. And as our creator, as our loving father, and as our savior, he wants us to love him. And that's what he is jealous for. God is jealous for us to love him. Um, and then the second definition of jealousy is feeling or expressing envy of another person, especially their possessions, position, or achievements. And this type of jealousy is the one that can sometimes get out of hand and lead to sin. Shakespeare famously wrote um, about jealousy in this quote from Othello. Do any Shakespeare fans in the room? Mm -hmm. He said, Oh, beware, my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. I love Shakespeare. And that's where we get the phrase green with envy. Um, it's interesting that our 10th commandment that God gave to Moses and his people the tenth commandment is, do y'all know? Have no other gods before me. Yeah. That's not the tenth. Okay. It's thou shalt not covet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thou shalt not covet. Yes. But coveting is like a gateway drug because <laughs> if you covet, if, if you if you don't covet, then you're pretty much assured of not messing up the other ones. But when you covet, you're more likely to well, if you break want some of the this, other you commandments. Might steal it. Well, there's one. If you want that and you steal it, well, you might need to kill somebody to steal it. Or, you know, it just leads to all these other. I things. have never heard that term used mm -hmm. about coveting, but that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, it's yeah, a gateway it, drug. It, well, and you, you know, like even for. Covetousness. You know, it, it, well, you know, a lot of people think it's like, well, it's the last one, it's the least important, but actually it's not. Because, it's, you know, one coveting is putting something above. You want that more than you want God. You want that more than, you know, it's focusing your desires on things that you have no business mm -hmm. desiring. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the Tenth Commandment. So Exodus twenty seventeen: you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And covetousness is really the opposite of contentment mm -hmm. um, and it can be a, it can be a form of idolatry mm -hmm. and so Paul talked about contentment even when he was imprisoned um, Philippians 4 says I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Um, and I think the way we learn contentment is to focus on gratitude and to focus on all the many things that we have. So to me, having a thankful attitude in your life as a whole is a way to be content. Um, and to help, that helps. I think when you focus on what you have and what you're grateful for, it helps to prevent us from being covetous. Covetous? To, it helps prevent us from wanting stuff that we don't necessarily need or want, right? Um, and so we know that 
a lot of these problems with Jacob's 12 sons, they all boil down to jealousy, right? Um, and we know it started with jealousy between Leah and Rachel. Leah was jealous of Rachel because Jacob loved her more. And she knew that. Jacob loved Rachel. Rachel was his favorite wife. So who could blame Leah for being jealous? Um, and I'm sure Leah, were you going to say something? Yes. Doesn't the Bible say that Leah was not loved? Therefore, God gave her children. That's yes. what it says. Yes. And then because God gave her children, then Rachel was jealous of Leah because Leah had children and Rachel was having trouble having children. So, so Rachel was jealous of Leah's fertility and her children. Um, and so I know that Leah in her jealous nature toward Rachel, that jealousy passed down to her sons. And so I'm sure that her, her boys heard her saying bad things about Rachel. And so naturally, they wouldn't like Rachel or Rachel's children when she had children. Um, and it's, it's really sad that, um, you know, Rachel had to wait so long to have Joseph. And then she had Joseph. And then when she finally was able to have her second son, she didn't survive childbirth. So her story of her young life is... It's sad. Um, but if you look at examples of what we have so far in the book of Genesis there's, Genesis, there's a lot of examples of favoritism and jealousy. And this is kind of the root of a lot of the sin that goes on throughout the Israelite history going forward from this point. Um, Isaac's favorite twin was Esau. So there was favoritism there. Rebecca's favorite twin was Jacob. Jacob envied Esau's birthright, and he coveted Isaac's blessing, and he wanted to trick his father into so, giving it yeah. to him instead of his brother. Jacob had his favorite wife, and Leah was jealous of, of Jacob's love for Rachel, and Rachel is jealous of Leah's children, and Leah is jealous of the maidservant's children. She says, oh, well, here, let me give you my maidservant so she can have kids also. And Laban and his sons were jealous of Jacob and all his blessings and his prosperity. And then Israel's sons are jealous of Joseph because Joseph is the one born to Jacob's favorite wife. Um, and so I sort of say, there's not a drawing up there, but if you look at all those sons of all those women, <laughs> all the half brothers are jealous of Joseph. They, there's, there's problems to come and we're gonna read about that today. So that's where we are in our story today. Let's get started reading through our verses. Just read for us, Dave. Would you read Genesis 37 verses two through eight? Two through eight? Mm -hmm. Okay. Said, right. The first part, yep. Okay. There are records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Beliah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored, a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Through five? Sorry. Yeah, keep okay. going through eight. Okay. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. Then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us, or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Yes. That's, so That's guaranteed. Yeah, I think you're using so, it. Like trying, to, trying to take them off. There's <laughs> already this jealousy and rivalry going yeah. on. and then you didn't have to tell him about his dream. There you go. Joseph was a teenager at this time, right? It says yeah. he was 17. And, of course, he starts off on the wrong foot with his brothers because he tattletales on them. Yeah. The, the story doesn't tell us what he what he told on, like what what was their crime, but he tattletales, and of course, I'm sure they're rebuked by their father, and so that does not help matters any, right? And uh, nobody nobody likes a snitch, and that's Joseph was you know telling on his brothers, and then of course Jacob, because he was his favorite son, gave Joseph this coat, and the word they used to describe this coat, there's some Interesting commentary on what it means. We've all heard of the coat of many colors. And so the adjective that's used to describe the coat is a little unclear exactly what it means. Some of the scholars say it means that it was very ornate 
and it had a lot of colors. And some of the commentaries think it means that it was a long robe with long sleeves. And so um, this was a special coat of some sort. And whether it was ornate with colors or long sleeves or both, um, we know that this was a special coat. This was not a coat or a robe that would have been worn by the field hands and the shepherds. This was a special coat that would have been worn by their superior, mm -hmm. right? And so Joseph gets this special coat and his brothers don't. So Jacob makes this situation worse mm -hmm. by showing his favoritism in such a glaring mm -hmm. way. <laughs> um, and so Joseph, we know, is younger than his other 10 brothers that he has at the time. And they hate him, and they could not even speak a kind word to him at all. So the situation is not good between him and his brothers. And then Joseph had this first dream. He dreamed about the, the sheaves of wheat, and foolishly, he shared this dream with his brothers. And some of the commentaries said that, well, he wasn't bragging about it, but I don't know. He was a teenager. He probably was kind of like in their faces with this dream the way he shared it with them and so he shared it with them and just makes this situation worse it says there they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said and then our focal verses skip over his second dream but we know he had a second dream and starting in verse 9 it says then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers <laughs> listen he said I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So he has another dream, and again, he is kind of sharing this dream and lording this dream over his brothers a little bit. So the situation is just getting worse. And so Jacob, then, one day, he decides to send Joseph out into the field to check on his brothers. His brothers were out raising the herds near Shechem. And as you recall, Shechem was where Simeon and Levi committed mass murder. And so I'm sure Jacob was worried about his boys being out near Shechem because, again, he was always concerned that someone might come back and take revenge on them. And so he sends Joseph out to check on his, his brothers. And then will you read for us in Genesis starting in verse 18 through verse 28? Let's read sure. what happens. <clears throat> when they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one, other, one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him or throw him into one of the pits. And we'll say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him. That night, that, that he might rescue him out, out, out of their hands and restore him to their father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him. And they took him and threw him in the pit. Now the pit was empty, without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for, for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Thank you, Dave. Sure, sure. So Joseph goes out uh, towards Shechem to find his brothers. And of course, he... Uh, he finds them where he's heading to the area where they are and they can see him coming a mile away because he has on this ornate, colorful coat, right? So I'm sure they're like, that's that's Jacob. They know it's it's their brother coming. And while they see him coming their direction, they plot to kill him. They are so jealous and hate him so much that they want to kill him. I mean, that just blows my mind. I mean, 
I know we've, any of us that have siblings, we've all dealt with fights and arguments and sibling rivalry and stuff. But in all the stuff like that we do, probably most of us have not planned to kill our brother or sister as much as we might dislike them, right? So these, these boys have really gone down a deep, dark place and they're wanting to kill Joseph. And so it says that they stripped him of his robe when he got there. And the verb used to say that indicates it was violent. They stripped him violently of his robe. It wasn't a, oh, take your coat off kind of a situation. It was a violent handling in the way they stripped this coat off of him. And then Reuben, the oldest brother, he really steps in and saves Joseph's life. And um, he gets his brothers to just throw him into the pit or the cistern. Um, and he thought in his head that he would go back and save him later. So thankfully, Reuben, the older, supposedly wiser brother, kind of steps in and intervenes. And because of him, they decide not to kill Joseph. So he really does save Joseph's life by convincing his brothers just to throw him into the cistern and not kill him. And then, unfortunately, Judah, another one of his half-brothers with Leah, right? Judah convinces the brothers that uh, they should sell him into slavery. Why don't they get something out of him, get something for him by selling him into slavery? So they decide that they're going to sell him off into slavery. They engage in human trafficking, and they do it for 20 shekels of silver. Mm -hmm. um, so Jacob's got these flawed children. I mean, look at what they, look at the history of what they've done so far, these, these boys. We had Simeon and Levi who slaughtered all the men in Shechem, then in chapter 35, we didn't even talk about this, but in chapter 35, Reuben slept with Bilhah, who was one of his father's wives. Bilhah was Rachel's maidservant, and um, she had two children with Jacob. And then Reuben, the oldest son, slept with her. It's weird, there's like a little verse just stuck in there out of the blue that tells us, so Y'all, there was all kinds of craziness going on in this household. And then, of course, we know that Joseph flaunts his status as uh, with Joseph as his favorite son. He gives him this coat. And then Joseph's um, brothers are jealous. They're filled with hatred. They want to kill him. They decide to sell their brother into slavery instead of kill him. Both those options are not good. Um, and then, of course, the boys plan to lie to their father, Jacob, about what happened to Joseph. So I don't know about you and your families, but these stories make me feel better about my own family. <laughs> so, the 12 sons of Israel are flawed and simple, but God uses them anyway. Um, it's hard to imagine these are God's chosen people. I mean, it really, it does give us all hope, right, that God uses these flawed and simple people. Um, Paul describes the condition of fallen man very well in Romans 1.29. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. And then when you're feeling pretty good about yourself because you don't do any of those things, Paul follows up in Romans 2.1 and Paul says this, but you do the same things. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else... For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. And Paul is really describing our condition because we are also sinners. Uh, maybe we didn't plot to kill our siblings, but we have sin. Um, we may have different sins, but it's still sin. And we are all guilty as well of some kind of sin in our life. Um, it reminds me of that famous quote, there but for the grace of God go I. I mean, if you think about it, Judah, look at what he did. He sold his brother Joseph. He was the one that convinced his brothers to sell Joseph into slavery. But yet Judah is the one chosen by God to be in the line of Jesus. And uh, I, I, it's funny because I read a lot of little commentaries. It's not really part of our lesson today, but I read some little commentaries asking the question like why would God choose Judah Judah sold Joseph into slavery why didn't he choose Joseph right of course we don't know why God chooses who he chooses God chooses who he wants to choose but in spite of Judah's sin in the story selling his brother into slavery there are some other stories later where Judah shows signs of a repentant heart mm -hmm. and 
that is a reminder that we sin and we fall short and we do horrible things. But yet, if we have a repentant heart, God still uses us. God still chooses us. And it was necessary for it, Joseph to be sold into slavery. There's so we're much good that comes out of that. Yeah. And we're going to be studying that as we finish up our study in Genesis. We're going to see how all the bad things that happened to Joseph, God used those for the good of his family, his brothers, and really all the people of his day that were saved um, and the famine. For the glory of God. That's exactly you know, and right. And we see as we'll get <clears throat> forward in our study of Joseph um, that God favored him and blessed him no matter what he put his hand to. Yeah. And I think God does that for his people. Yeah, I'm always thankful for Peter. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He was I do want to talk a little bit about the symbolism in today's story of Joseph because there's a lot of symbolism uh, in Joseph. Um, in fact, um, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, before we even get into the symbolism, I want to say that God... Talk, there's a takeaway I wanted to mention to you guys in the story, and that that is that God sometimes speaks to us in dreams. And I wanted to mention this before I even before I get into the symbolism, because we are approaching what many people to believe the end of yeah. days. Yeah. And I do believe that we're going to see more people becoming prophets that will be spoken to in dreams, because this is biblical. I mean, we know that. Uh, Jacob had a dream about the stairway to heaven and God spoke to him through that dream and gave him those blessings that he'd given to his father and grandfather. And then um, Joseph, of course, has these dreams. He sees the sheaves of wheat and then he has the dream about the stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to him. And then later, Joseph becomes famous for his ability to interpret dreams. Um, Daniel in the Old Testament was also famous for his ability to interpret dreams. And Joseph, um, and this is from Matthew 1, 20 through 21, it said, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not, this is the other Joseph, Mary's Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph, Mary's husband, the earthly father of Jesus was spoken to in a dream. And then, of course, we had Paul in the New Testament. Paul had his vision of a man from Macedonia in Acts 16. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, um, instead of going to Asia for his ministry, they decided to go to Greece in the area around Greece because, because of this dream he had, this vision. And then in Acts 2, 17, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And then um, the same thing is said in the Old Testament in Joel 2, 28. This is Joel talking about the day of the Lord. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. So I think it's important as believers that we are aware that God can speak to us through dreams. And so when we have a dream like that, we need to remember it, right? We need to take heed when God speaks to us through a dream because that is a biblical way that God uses to, to communicate to his people. Um, and then now I want to get back to the symbolism. So um, I was teasing you earlier. So the symbolism in the story of Joseph, we know that Joseph in this story represents Christ. And think about all the things that happen in his story. So Joseph was Jacob's dearly beloved son just like Jesus was God's dearly loved son. Jacob's Israelite brothers were jealous of him and plotted to kill him. And in Jesus' day, it was the Jewish leaders of his time that plotted to have him killed. Joseph's brothers stripped him of his coat, his coat of many colors, just like the Roman soldiers stripped Jesus of his robe. Um, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver at the urging of his brother Judah. 
And Jesus was betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. And what's interesting is that Judas, the name Judas, is the Greek form of Judah. Um, and both of them betrayed a brother. Um, later, Joseph saves his entire family during the famine. In fact, he saves not just his family, but all the people in the area where they live because he got them to store up wheat and food so that they would have food when the drought and the famine hit. Um, and then what does Jesus do? Jesus saved all who would believe in him. So there's some symbolism as we read about Joseph in his life that is a foreshadowing of Jesus who is yet to come and what Jesus is coming to do when he, when he is born into the world. <clears throat> and it's interesting, Joseph um, saved people with wheat. He got them to store up wheat so that they would have food during the famine. And Jesus saves us by being our bread of life. Um, and so in time, of course, we know God does have us a lot to say to us about jealousy in today's lesson. <laughs> Um, and I had to go to gotquestions.org. <laughs> what does the Bible say about jealousy? And there's some good stuff here I wanted to read to y'all. When we use the word jealous, we use it in a sense of being envious of someone who has something we do not have. This kind of jealousy is a sin and is not characteristic of a Christian. Rather, it shows that we are still being controlled by our own desires. Galatians 5.26 says, let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. The Bible tells us that we are to have the perfect kind of love that God has for us. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And that's from 1 Corinthians 13. The more we focus on ourselves and our own desires, the less we are able to focus on God. When we harden our hearts to the truth, we cannot turn to Jesus and allow him to heal us. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, he will produce in us the fruit of our salvation, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jacob's brothers didn't seem to have any of those things. Being jealous indicates that we are not satisfied with what God has given us. The Bible tells us to be content with what we have, for God will never fail or forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5. In order to combat jealousy, we need to be more like Jesus and less like ourselves. We can get to know him through Bible study, prayer, and fellowship with mature believers. As we learn to serve others instead of ourselves, our hearts will begin to change. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, this, when I read through this article, it reminds me of one of my favorite Bible verses. Um, and this is one of my favorite Psalms. This is Psalm 37 4 take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart um, you know Josh talked a little bit about this in his sermon today he talked about how David when he looked out from his King David looked out from his palace and he saw that God had just a tent for the Ark of the Covenant he desired to give something to God to build a beautiful temple for God um, and then Nathan said, sure, yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. But when Nathan went to God, God kind of turned it around and said, you want to build me a temple, but I want to build you and tell a lasting legacy. Your line is going to have a kingship that lasts forever. And Josh talked about how a church building, a, a temple, a tabernacle, anything we build, it's temporary. That God wants to build in us a legacy that's going to last forever. And so when I think when we have jealous tendencies, when we are envious, when we covet things, um, we are, we're basically slapping God in the face and saying, what you've blessed me with isn't enough, God. If we instead would put our focus on getting closer to God, 
if we put our focus on following Jesus, God is going to take care of our desires. God is going to bless us in ways that are beyond our comprehension. But he only does that when we make him our focus. He's not going to um, bless us if we are idolatrous in our ways that we covet the things of this world and the things that other people have. Um, there's another article in gotquestions.org. It's about what is what does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? And I'm going to read this and wrap it up with this with this article. It's another good one. Um, it's the first time I've read this about my one of my favorite Psalms. Um, Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Taking delight in the Lord means that our hearts truly find peace and fulfillment in him. If we truly find satisfaction and worth in Christ, Scripture says he will give us the longings of our hearts. Does that mean if we go to church every Sunday, God will give us a new Rolls Royce? <laughs> no. The idea behind the verse and others like it is that when we truly rejoice or delight in the eternal things of God, our desires will begin to parallel his, and we will never go unfulfilled. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All those necessities of life. Many delight in wealth, status, material possessions, and other temporary things of this world, but they are never satisfied. They never truly get what they want, hence the reason that you're always wanting more. This is the lesson King Solomon learned in his pursuit of earthly treasure. Everything is meaningless, and that's from Ecclesiastes. Yeah. On the other hand, delighting in the Lord is true treasure indeed. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's from Timothy. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. We will never be deeply fulfilled or happy with the things this world has to offer. If we place our joy and hope in God first, he will meet all of our needs. He will even grant our wants as our heart's desires begin to match up with his will. If we truly place priority on the Lord, chances are our heart's greatest desire will not be a brand new Rolls Royce, but eternal treasures in Christ. The world can never satisfy our deepest longings, but if we choose to delight in God's way, he will always provide above and beyond our expectations. Jesus said, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Will y'all bow with me and we'll close in prayer.